Good afternoon everyone. Um, just thought I'd do a, a video today looking at um, the first part of the build which is the Quadratra Oscillator uh, Generator. Um, this particular circuit, uh, there's nothing special here. Uh, you will see this circuit uh, mentioned many times on the internet. Um, so just to recap, what we're trying to generate up front um, is some quadrature uh, clock or uh, quadrature oscillator signals that we can feed into our NE612s to produce um, the audio out which will then feed into our Teensy. So what we did as we uh, outlined in the, uh, the earlier video is we've now hooked up the, uh, the Teensy microcontroller We've hooked that up to the uh, the screen, and we'll look at the circuit diagram in a sec. Uh, we've also connected the rotary encoder, and we have connected over here the SI5351, and clock zero is going through to our SN74HC74, which is that dual uh, D flip-flop chip. And like I say, uh, in a sec we'll have a look at the circuit diagram. So the whole idea of this circuit here is for the... Uh, at the moment, the way it's configured is for the Tensi to drive the SI5351 and to multiply our selected frequency by 4. That's what's coming out the green coax here. It goes into our dual D flip-flop uh, counter or flip-flop device, um, which then outputs two quadrature outputs. Um, at one quarter of what's coming out of here. So in other words, we've got the frequency down here selected to 3.7 megahertz. It's been multiplied by four. It clocks the two D flip-flops and then coming out is um, our output at 3.7 megahertz because this effectively does, it does a divide by four. And we can see that up here up on the scope. So just recapping. So we have two probes here. Um, this probe here is probing the input or the clock signal that's going into the D flip-flops coming out of our SI5351 and then the other channel is looking at one of the two outputs and that's what we see up here on the screen. So the top trace is the output which is at in this particular case 3.7 megahertz and we can see the clock um, coming out of the SI5351 um, sitting at four times our desired frequency. And you can see that when we move it up, if we were just to sort of go there roughly, you can see one, two, three, four, four per uh, output. So it is a, indeed a divide by four. Uh, and if we were now to move that um, that probe to the other output. Oops, there's it. Uh, come on. We can see there now. So we're now looking at the two outputs of the quadrature, and you can see there that 90 degrees phase shift. So if I just sort of step them off a little bit and then vary the frequency, you can see those so they're sitting there nicely uh, in sync. And the good thing too is if we were to look at the amplitude. Um, one of the disadvantages of the SI5351 at higher frequencies is that the output tends to drop off in amplitude, whereas in this particular case, because it's a, uh, a logic device, um, it, just, it just keeps the same amplitude all the way through. So I'm now sitting up there at uh, 14, and now 24, so right now at 27, in fact I'll come down a bit, lost there. So that's uh, 27 megahertz. So that's 27 megahertz indicated um, on the display. So the output of the SI5351 is actually four times that. But um, that's, that's, that's fine. So, um, what else is of interest to look at that? Uh, so yeah, so when the we talked in an earlier video and um, in some of the comments about generating those two quadrature signals directly from the SI5351, uh, say 
whatever we wish to use, uh, notionally clock zero and clock one. Um, that is still a, uh, a winter project, but uh, as you can see, one, one of the disadvantages we would have with that approach is for the higher frequencies, uh, we would have a drop off in the amplitude uh, coming out of the SI5351. So indeed, we would have to um, have a couple of amplifiers, one for each channel, um, uh, basically keeping the output amplitude constant. Uh, and why I say that is because the next part of this project will have to now feed the output of this um, this generator here, this oscillator or clock generator, whatever you want to call it, into our NE612s. Now the NE612 needs to see between 200 and 300 millivolts peak to peak. So the good thing with this particular setup, because we have um, a constant amplitude output across the frequency range, um, I can just get away with using a couple of simple, uh, in this particular case I'm going to use a couple of 20k trim pots, um, it's just junk box ones, I want something in the K range, uh, and I can set that on the output and then just trim to get um, the desired under load 200 to 300 millivolts peak to peak. Um, so that's one of the advantages of actually sticking with this particular circuit here is I don't have to worry about um, the reduction in amplitude of the SI5351 at the higher frequencies. So um, just coming back to the circuit diagram and then after which we'll have a look at the code. So like I say this is a, um, a, a, a very standard um, circuit, there's nothing nothing special here. Um, this box here is the notionally the, the Teensy, uh, the rotary encoder, the LCD screen and the SI5351. Um, what I've elected to do um, and you can sort of just see it down here. The, the, the square board at the bottom is the audio board and then that has a series, has quite a few pins that it requires to interface with the actual Tensi itself. This is a 3.5 and there are a number of spare pins that stick well beyond um, that board or in other words are not used by the board and I've tapped into some of those so we don't have any interference with the communications going on with um, the audio board. So for the rotary encoder, if you recall um, a couple of videos back, that's got five pins coming out of it. On the three pin side, center is earth and the two outputs go to uh, 35 and 36. Um, now if, if you were to wire this up and the frequency was going opposite to what you expected, then just flip those two wires around. Or in the software, flip around the pin assignments. Uh, flipping the pin assignments in the software is certainly easier. And on the other side, which is the switch side of the encoder, one side is earth and the other side is going to pin 39 of the Teensy. Um, the SDA output for zero, there's got a couple of SDA channels on the Teensy. So SDA zero is on pin 18 and SCL zero is on 19. So here we have those, the LCD screen interface with 18 and 19 and then in parallel with that is the SI5351. Uh, and each of those devices also require an earth and uh, 5 volts. You can see out here the output of uh, the SI53 clock 0, which is this one here, is now going down um, and is using as the, uh, the clock signal and putting into these two D flip-flops. Um, just a simple voltage divider bias here, just setting up the clock to be at 0. Uh, with two 10k ohm resistors sitting between 5 volts and 0 um, and this is just a really nice way of uh, getting a nice clean clocking signal um, outputting from the, uh, the SI5351 not indicated there, um, that's 100 nanofarads um, and then that clocks our two D flip-flops um, and ranged in such a way that uh, the output produces our quadrature outputs again three at the moment, just a couple of 100 nanofarad capacitors. Um, the SN74, uh, HC74 is a 14 pin device, um, so there are a few pins there which are not used um, in, the, in the circuit diagram here, and that's going to go down here, so pins 1, 4, 10 and 13 um, are all tied to VCC, I just haven't included them here for clarity. Um, pin 5 and, and pin 8 are, are not used. So that's that's effectively what we have to generate our quadrature oscillator or our quadrature clock 
and now the next step will be to look at interfacing that with our NE612s um, which will be the, the next steps. Right, so I'm going to pause here and uh, we'll just bring up the software and we'll just have a look at the differences or the changes made to the software that was presented a couple of videos back um, to, to make it compatible with the um, with this particular arrangement and the, and the Teensy. So just hold on and we'll be back shortly. Okay, so let's um, take a look at some software here. Um, and firstly, um, I, I again apologise for the quiet, slightly quiet audio. Um, I've gone into Windows 10, I've gone into recording devices, I've gone to the properties for the microphone, um, I've got boost turned on to 30 dB and 100%, um, and for whatever reason I just can't seem to make this um, volume any louder, so um, I apologise for that. So what we have here is essentially the same software as we presented uh, in a couple of videos back, just looking at um, the software required to, to talk to and to control the SI5351. Uh, later on we will add to the software to include um, the additional functionality to actually do the software defined. So we'll introduce the DSP filters and we'll do that um, uh, later on. So this is just the initial code and like I say as we go through the build we will add um, more functionality in. So um, for those who haven't used the Teensy uh, with the um, IDE, um, if you go to the PRJC website where the Teensy comes from um, or you do a Google search on Teensy and the Arduino IDE, the Integrated Development Environment, um, you will find some links to allow you or to show you how to basically do the add-in to the IDE to allow you to talk to um, the Arduino. So then under tools and under boards, you will then get the Teensy range coming up uh, coming up here. So it's, it's very straightforward and once you've got it, uh, it's in. Right, so looking at the software here, um, I'll try and remember what I talked about last time and only talk about the differences. Um, so no real change here. Um, I've just notionally said that the highest frequency we can go to is uh, 30 megs and starting at 1 meg. Uh, you'll recall just in the circuit diagram the pin assignments. So you can see here that a push pin on that rotary encoder we assigned to the digital pin 39. Uh, and the two rotary pins were 35 and 36. So those are, you'll need to make sure that that is updated with whatever pins you elect to use. And then we basically um, initialize or instantiate the uh, the two objects. So here, on this particular one, I'm using the liquid crystal display. So I've included the library to talk to that. Um, and in my particular screen here, the address to talk to it was um, 3F octal. Um, sometimes you'll find it's it's octal 27, um, but when I powered it up, it didn't work, so I went to uh, 3F, and lo and behold, up she came. Uh, and there we are, just enabling there the SI5351. No real changes here, um, basically just setting up the input pins using those defined um, uh, integer constants up here, and then turning on the pull-up resistors. Again, assigning the two interrupt pins. So I know I'm going slightly fast here, but it's just a repeat of the video we did a couple back. Um, uh, turning on the screen uh, and initializing the DDS. Uh, no changes to this part here. Um, and in fact, you will find from this point onwards, except for the last line, there are no changes. So the, the, the main loop there is no changes, so it's looking for a change in frequency, and if there is a change, it'll update the display and then send the frequency. And it's also looking for to see if the push pin has changed. Um, there is actually one change that I have made to, again, I'm just going over here because there's been no changes at all. This is all the same, all the same here through what happens when you rotate the rotary encoder. So for more information, go back a couple of videos. But what I've elected to do here, um, I tried to look at 
for the for the digit that I want to change with the rotary encoder, um, I was initially toying with the idea of inverting the color. So rather than making it in this particular case white on blue, I'd make it a um, a white box with a um, with a black number. Um, the, the particular screen doesn't support that, so I reverted to something I did um, some time ago, and that's to use the underline cursor. So right here at the start of the update display, I am turning on the actual cursor. And if you go back in this particular video here, back to where I'm showing the LCD screen, um, you will see under the digit that's being changed, a cursor. Um, as opposed to being a dash or a hyphen on the whole row below it. Um, and I did that to allow me to use that second row to display additional functionality. And that may turn out as we go through with this project to be, uh, for example, the audio bandwidth um, of the filter we'll use at the end of the SDR radio. Uh, it could be a memory mode for doing some kind of memory scanning. Uh, or something like that. So in order to free up that row, I've gone to a, uh, a subtly different way of actually showing uh, what digit is being changed. Um, so again, and this is what is happening here. So depending on what the red X is set to, in other words, which digit I'm changing, I then place that cursor under it in the, in the, in the suitable position. So here's in position six, position um, so again seven, six, five, four, etc., etc. Um, and I think I covered it in that last video talking about the software. Um, these two if statements here: one when it's greater than 10 megs, and one when it's lower than 10 megs, uh, just to make things look nice and um, nice and even on the screen. And the only difference we can see down here. Um, between or the other difference we can see in this software versus what was presented a couple of videos back is we now want to multiply our frequency by four um, because as we just mentioned before that D flip-flop the dual D flip-flops there uh, in the process of creating or generating the quadrature signals divides the clock that they've been clocked at by four so in order to make sure that we actually get the right frequency coming out uh, and the frequency matching what we wanted, which is this one here, we need to multiply that by four. Uh, so that's the only really thing you have to do. Nothing special up here in terms of multiplying and dividing things by four. Just do it at the very end uh, and it's nice and simple. So that's um, a very brief and quick rundown on the software. Like I say, we are going to add to this. We're going to add additional functions to basically do our phasing uh, technique to demodulate um, that audio. Uh, what we're also going to do, um, I'm going to play around with um, having the audio coming into the Teensy board at 10 kilohertz, uh, which is roughly half of the bandwidth of the um, analog to digital converter. Uh, it's sampling at 44 kilohertz, so no, sorry, again, 22 if I recall. Um, so that's what we're going to do, um, or so I'm going to play with anyway. So what we'll have to do then, um, and we'll cover that certainly in a, in a, in a future video, is then uh, using um, heterodyne, we'll bring that down uh, in uh, software down to um, DC and go from there. So that's the only real difference. But we'll, like I say, we'll cover that in depth. Uh, at a later uh, in a later video so i'm going to leave that there um, any questions please sing out um, but if you look at that video we did a couple a couple of videos back on software um, you'll you'll certainly see where the differences are uh, and it's pretty minor it's just making sure that the particular screen we're using right now um, is the right one we've got the right pin assignments for uh, the rotary encoder and like i say we've got at the very end uh, our frequency being multiplied by four, as well as a subtle change to the way in which um, the curse is being displayed. Okay, enough there. Um, I wish everybody 73s, and uh, we'll continue on with this particular project. Cheers all.